Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode. I'm very happy today to be joined by Vivek Ramachandran. Uh, I, he, his resource, uh, Pentester Academy and security tube were some of the first resources that I, that I use when I was getting started as a pen tester in 2012, I got laid off from my job application security job, and I wanted to move into penetration testing. So I needed some good resources to learn Python as well as some, some other different hacking skills. And that was one of the first resources I found, which was a very affordable resource compared to the competition. And one of the things, Vivek is someone I highly, uh, I, that I re- highly respect. And one of the things I really like about him, some of the things he's done was when he was running Pentester Academy, he tried to keep the product affordable globally. Sometimes if you're in the US, that's easy to keep it affordable here. But when you're trying to keep it affordable for someone in India or Africa or somewhere like that, it's a little more of a challenge. So uh, it really, I really respect people that have the heart to think of others and think beyond themselves. So it's a huge honor to have Vivek joining today. Welcome, Vivek. Uh, thanks, Philip. Thanks for that uh, you know very nice, sweet introduction. Uh, super excited to be on the show, and uh, you know looking forward to talking to you and probably uh, to your viewers. Yeah, it's uh, very awesome to have you on here, and it was cool that we finally got to meet in Singapore last year during Hack the Box, Hack in the Box. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes you speak to folks, you know, so much over Twitter and other places, and then it's very uncanny when you finally meet them. Right. So it was uh, yeah, superb to kind of meet you finally face to face, you know, sit down, have that uh, great lunch, exchange notes on what's going on in the industry and all of that. Uh, yeah. So it was fun. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, even though we've known each other online for a while, I just felt like, you know, seeing an old friend in person. So it was really, really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Likewise, I'm looking forward to probably seeing you at DEF CON or, you know, one of the security conferences later this year. Sure, I look forward to it. It's just, it seemed this is it's so surreal to, after all those years, me watching you on the screen and now you're actually on my podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting older. So very, very soon, you know, those old videos where I was looking super young and, and me now, people probably uh-huh. aren't going to be able to make a quick comparison and say it's the same guy. Maybe 10 more years and that'll look like some young guy while, you know, I probably graduated uh, uh, to to probably some age group where it's not recognizable anymore. (laughs) Well, one thing that's awesome, too, is to see that how you were, you know, following your passion, passion, you know, doing your own business then and how you've evolved. And now, you know, you you you're starting a, a new startup you know, a technology company, security technology. And it's just really cool to see that evolved and see how you you follow your dreams. And that's very inspirational to others that, that would be considering trying to start their own business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a very scenic journey. Uh, you know, overall, I would say a lot of things happened purely by coincidence. So interestingly, I got my very first laptop, like literally in the year 1999. And I was, I think, uh, 18 years old. Because at that time I was in India and, you know, there were no uh, computers around, forget even laptops. And I still remember it was almost uh, my dad's like three months pay uh, to even get us a computer. And that was a very big family decision at that point. Uh, So from from there on, you know, kind of like things started and all of that. So I think, you know, uh, at the right time in the show, I can run you through what that journey was and and all Sure. Since we're just kind of getting started out, why don't you kind of share your, your journey, education to, you know, starting the businesses, the things you've done, because I know you've done some security research before in in the past. So if you just yeah. want to kind of share with our listeners sure. kind of your background. Sure. So I think, you know, when I got my first computer at that time, of course, I was still studying for my engineering exams. So very early on, I started using it purely to research about physics and whatnot. But at, that was the time when, you know, roughly, I think the year 2000, that all these big distributed denial of service attacks were happening on Yahoo and a couple of sites. And I started becoming very curious how, you know, a hacker could bring down uh, these massive gigantic sites back in the day. So once I did research, I heard about this hacker called Mixter, who had written this DDoS tool called Trinu, Tribal Flood Network. 
and out of curiosity i started googling you know downloaded the tool and when i opened up the source code you know couldn't understand anything of course right by at that time i had not programmed i had not looked at things in an intricate way and that really piqued my curiosity because i was like okay what is this language and all of it was written in c uh, so i quickly started learning c and just to be able to understand much of this code and by that time you know i went into engineering uh, so i had a lot of time to just sit learn teach myself and remember back in the day i think cyber security forget mainstream it wasn't even much of a niche like there there was probably defcon and just one or two other conferences uh, and apart from that i don't even remember anything i mean in india there was no cyber security no hacking scene there was no conference no meet up so you were kind of working a little bit like in a silo uh, fast forward you know i got an internship at a university in zurich to work on wifi security and i still remember when i went there i had never seen a wifi access point and if you recall back in the day you had these pcm cia wifi cards which you had to insert into the slots and all uh, so when i got those cards i was like okay what do i even do with this like where do i put it because the slots are all covered up uh, but again you know then i sat down you know taught myself uh, how to use uh, low level raw socket programming and all of that write packet injectors uh, create attack tools and what not so once i graduated i worked for a couple of companies worked for cisco you know did a couple of uh, small projects there in layer 2 security port security 802.1x and all but frankly very quickly i figured like i wasn't enjoy enjoying building security products i loved breaking security products and this was the time i was lucky there was this company in india called airtight networks who was working and building wireless intrusion detection systems and they wanted somebody to come in and do research and development on wireless attacks so that was the place where you know i broke a technology called web cloaking i discovered the cafe latte attack uh and you know all those years i was just looking at uh, defcon videos but in 2007 i got an opportunity to actually present at defcon which was a very pivotal moment you know kind of like in my life because i suddenly felt like oh you know what here are all of these hackers around the world coming together sharing knowledge and there are like minded folks who also loved breaking security uh because that was 2006 2007 when you told people that you loved breaking security loved writing these attack tools everybody used to just laugh there was no career there was nothing you could do with it right apart from you know just quench your own curiosity uh for what it's worth so fast forward once i did all of those talks came back i quickly realized i didn't want to do traditional product development so i quit my job uh moved into my parents place because i was still young hadn't saved up much and in this very small mezzanine floor at my parents place uh i started building securitytube.net uh and interestingly the the inspiration for the site was that when i was working at airtight and i had found all these attacks written all these tools you know people used to come ask me hey vivek how do we go about learning this and i realized that you know i had kind of learned things in a very tribal way looking at code experimenting trying things out and there was no good systematic documentation around how to do all of this so actually i started a very small site before that called security-freak.net which became securitytube.net uh lo and behold readership started growing from around the world and i started getting you know emails requesting me to fly down and teach people uh in real world settings so 2011 i actually formed the company which was the parent company binary security group and using that i ended up traveling almost 20 25 countries if i recall in just a span of 2 years i never came back to india i was just hopping one airport to the other uh picking up every single paid training assignment that i could get and over 2 years saved up a little bit of money you know to kind of start the company uh you know hire more folks in and that's when i launched security tube training which was really just one off course selling and all of that uh that transitioned over to pentester academy and you know pentester academy you know started off as this videos eventually became a lab platform and fantastic i just ran it a couple of good years you know 2021 got acquired by ine and from there on i've moved you know to this new company squarex 
but I'm actually building a security product, you know, targeting consumers. So that's a very scenic view of how life has been so far. <laughs> yeah, that, that's very interesting because I remember when I first started, uh, you know, using Security Tube, reviewing Security Tube was about 2012. So it was pretty interesting to see see how it's how it's evolved and interesting how you got into that. So, uh, kind of what are, what are you doing? What what type type of product do you have at SquareX? What are you developing there? Yeah. So, you know, over the last 20, 22 years of being in cybersecurity, I kind of realized that the reason a lot of consumer products don't work is they get in the way of productivity. And I'll just give you a very simple example. Uh, let's say, you know, someone, you know, ordinary non-technical person ends up receiving an email from a recruiter with a word file attachment. He tries to open it. The antivirus screams there is malware, a virus or whatever in it. In all probability, now he either has to decide not to open that document or disable the AV and open it because, hey, you know, that job offer is just that important. So, you know, the entire existing generation of consumer security products and, and even enterprise work by blocking access to files, resources, websites. And that actually brings down productivity. And that is the key insight behind SquareX is, well, could you create a product which does not get in the way of productivity, never blocks access to files or resources, instead even allows you to view that same, you know, word file with malware, but making sure that you're never, you know, in danger of getting probably hacked, attacked, uh, or, you know, any form of other malicious activity happening. And that is really what SquareX is. You know, we are trying to create an absolutely new paradigm shift product uh, targeting consumers where the idea is, hey, open everything, uh, go to any website, we'll make sure we protect you. And the way we kind of do that is it's possible to render things in the cloud and then project it back to your computer and into your browser in a very seamless way. Uh, whereas an end user, you never really realize that what you're looking at is cloud rendered. And if you're able to do it in a way which is seamless, then to the end user, it's this better experience. He never gets to, you know, uh, so nothing ever gets blocked and he can always be productive. So that, that's the whole vision of SquareX. Yeah, that sounds like a great solution because you figure nowadays that most of the attacks, you know, from a corporate standpoint are usually some kind of phishing attacks. Right. Someone sends someone a file, they click on the file and they gain access to their system. Uh, they get ransomware, some kind of malware. So that that's really good. It'd be nice for companies to not have to worry about when people click on stuff, you know? Exactly. And and if you also look at it, uh, you know, Philip, the entire current generation of security products works with a probabilistic model, right? So imagine that, you know, you have Norton, you have Avast, you have a bunch of other antiviruses and you feed them the same file. Some of them are going to say this is malicious and maybe some of them end up saying, you know what, this is all okay, go open it. Now, what this ends up doing is it is so confusing for the end user uh, that they know have no way to actually figure out that something went wrong. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And especially when you mention the consumer side of things too, you know, we, if we really want a more safer cyberspace, you really have to do something to secure the end users because there's so many times they click on something on Facebook and then it sends it to one of their friends, they get infected and, you know, a lot of these different cyber attacks, of course, you know, for end users, usually it's uh, going to be through like social media, maybe through email phishing. And you see how that is so much on the rise. You look at your email nowadays and you see the number used to before it was spam, but there's such a high percentage of, of uh, phishing attacks. And there was my, my wife's little sister actually had someone, okay. uh, send her like a file last year she clicked on it and she transferred thirty four thousand dollars to the attacker they Great. they told him yeah. it was from best buy or something like geek squad and they tricked her into saying we're good we, we owe you this money they're going to transfer oh we sent you too much can you yeah. let us you know take control of your system and they took control and fortunately the bank saw that it was something suspicious and blocked it but when you figure you look at the the older community, you know, people like in their 50s and older don't understand technology. It's really kind of hard for them to protect themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really where if you notice, you know, there's a lot of advances which have happened in enterprise security. 
but much of that has not translated back into consumer security. So if you look at the whole consumer security space today, all you have is antiviruses, anti-malware, anti-spyware. Uh, and these were all built at a time when file viruses, worms, and all of those things were like, you know, the real concern people had. But today in a web first world, as you rightly said, for most users, your browser is the operating system. All they do when they switch on their computer is open the browser and that's it. Like that's your gateway to everything. And that's really where what we've done is, you know, SquareX literally runs in the browser as a browser extension. And with the help of a cloud service, you know, ends up doing, you know, whatever magic I just mentioned. Uh, and that way by sitting in the browser, we can actually do a lot of, you know, kind of security things like data leakage prevention, which can detect many of these phishing attacks. Uh, you can go about trying to detect hijacking happening, SSL MITM attacks, you know, what not. Uh, and what, from what we've seen in the consumer space, all of this has been sorely lacking uh, almost for the past decade. And that's really where you see all of this. Also now with generative AI, you know, it's so easy to even mimic someone's voice. Uh, you, you might have seen some of those videos with just maybe a couple of seconds of, you know, us talking. You could literally have, you know, Vivek and Philip's voice cloned uh, in no time. So uh, a massive new generation of threats is probably going to come because of, you know, all of these advances, uh, which existing solutions aren't really built to tackle. Well, it really makes sense what you're kind of do. You, you, you're thinking the way the things work. You said it's rendered in the cloud and you think about like malware analysis. Someone, they usually sandbox it from the rest of their environment. So you know, people are basically being able to do the same thing. It's And one of the things that'd be kind of interesting too is, you know, some of the research and some of the data that you'll be able to collect running this in the in, in, in your cloud environment, the information that you could glean from that that could help other areas of security, I think would be very valuable as well. Absolutely. So, so one of the things we want to do is, you know, users can opt in to share their user statistics anonymously. And we hope we can use that to learn how to protect them better and the idea would be to share it with the rest of the community at conferences, you know, or open up the data in an anonymous way so that other researchers can also look at it, you know, make recommendations and whatnot. So having been part of the security community, I understand how important it is for, you know, people to share knowledge. So that's where I'm hoping with SquareX, uh, we can kind of do it very early on. So we plan to, you know, open source some of the interesting parts of the product. We plan to go ahead and speak at conferences, talking about what we are seeing in the front lines as hopefully once, you know, we start to get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of installs of the product, uh, we get all of that interesting info, which is probably valuable to other researchers as well. And we plan to even have a freemium version, which people can use and the base protection itself will be fantastic. So, you know, it will be able to detect, you know, most phishing attacks, it will be able to detect hijacking, SSL, MITM. And all of that would be available absolutely for free. The only thing we plan to charge for is anything where, you know, we may end up using a cloud service and, you know, incur compute or memory resources or, or whatever expense ourselves. So I'm hoping that, you know, this, this company can be a good balance between once again, contributing back to the community, like I was able to with security tube and pen tester. Uh, at the very same time, you know, it being a real viable business so that I could probably do it for the next 10, 15 years and beyond. Very, very good, man. That, that's going to really help enterprises and, and individuals alike. And it's nice that you have a freemium model because there's some cases where, you know, people can't afford, you know, a subscription for, for an antivirus or something like that. And that pretty much when, when you see what your product's doing, that really reduces a lot of the risk that you normally would take care of with an antivirus because you know usually we're not getting executable files from places unless you download it online pretty much anything you come in contact with is through email or the internet through the web exactly exactly so i think you know isolation technologies when it comes to whether it's browser isolation or you know sandboxing with containers whatnot if you look at the enterprise space you know these technologies are very mature uh, of course, over there, they're primarily used to kind of cage down user access and whatnot. Uh, while in the consumer space, you know, these technologies are really non-existent today. And that's really where, you know, a large part of what we are doing is also trying to see how we can bridge that gap uh, and make available to consumers what 
probably someone should have i don't know maybe even a couple of years back so me being in pentester academy having taught people for such a long time seeing these technologies evolve i myself used to get frustrated as to like hey why isn't this available to my dad you know or my mom when they access the internet i mean you know the tech is there it is cheap enough to deploy doesn't necessarily need to be locked behind you know enterprise gates where you need to start off with an account size of $100,000 a year or something like that and and i'm hoping that you know th- this this whole bridging is is something people benefit from and people like once we put it out there yeah so as far as the is there any kind of i w- would assume basically since it's saas place based and you said it's rendering in the cloud that that it wouldn't affect internet speeds it seems like to a degree someone with slower internet may have a better experience on the internet since these pages are being rendered in the cloud absolutely absolutely and i think you know that's really where one of the active things you're working on is to reduce the amount of bandwidth required to go ahead and do many of these things live uh, but from what we've seen for most folks the bandwidth that they have is more than sufficient so if you have you know 2 to 3 megabits of bandwidth available uh you know what you kind of build should just work seamlessly absolutely full throttle you would really not see any form of lag or any form of issues uh and that's really where what's happened is if you look at you know browser isolation container based isolation and all of that in the enterprise space much of the work which has happened is primarily around purely the security aspect and not really providing the user a great experience So if you've ever used a browser isolation technology you would see that sites don't load properly videos load badly you know some things don't render as it would if you had just opened it up in a regular browser uh and that's really where you know I've spoken even to enterprise users and they do not like what they see and we are planning to kind of put people first productivity first and hope we can first delight them with the product itself where security just happens in the background uh we don't want even we don't even want to go in and say hey security is a prefix we want it to be a post fix enable the user to do his regular activities increase his productivity security just happens rather than you know block him stop him say no to things uh which will probably have him anyway disable your product and and be even more insecure so i'm assuming that you're going to support all major browsers with this product Yes, absolutely. So I think you know we are going to begin with Chrome, but given it's an extension, you know it can actually work across all browsers. And hopefully in the next couple of months we plan to roll out for Safari as well, and then you know Firefox. Of course, Chrome compatible browsers like Brave and and a couple of others that'll just work out of the box, uh, you know, as soon as we release it for Chrome. But yeah, that's the idea. And eventually a mobile version as well, probably be a dedicated app. Oh, very good. That was going to be my next question: Is yeah. was there going to be we were were you going to support mobile? So that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. So what we figured is, you know, you want to target power users first. You know, people who spend a couple of hours in front of the computer, you know, working in the browser, working on their desktop, uh, because we feel like you know those folks would end up appreciating what we do a lot more. And then mobile technologies also, unfortunately, you know. mobile platforms are locked down there are so many things that you can't do i mean as you know on ios you know you might not have too much access android is starting to get there as well and that's really where on mobile devices it's almost like reinventing uh, a lot of the stuff which over the desktop and the cloud just works and figuring out how to kind of like do it right and and that's really where you know there's going to be more intensive work when it finally comes to mobile very cool so uh How did you come up with the name Square? So where did the name of the company come from? Yeah. So Squarex, I mean when I was thinking about it, you know, I figured that as a security company, you always need to have uh this ability that you are chasing the latest threats, you're researching, trying to figure out something new about it. Uh and that's really where what I thought was, hey, let's break it up into two parts. Square is this very foundational unit. Uh you know where it kind of symbolizes stability and that's really where the idea is we are trying to give a very foundational stable secure super strong product and x is this entire universe of unknown so in algebra you know you kind of remember that solve for x right we always try to figure out what that x is so idea is squarex is a company which is grounded in that solid foundational security 
but chasing this universe of unknown threats and we know that you know by keeping that whole outlook that we are a lab chasing the unknown uh, you almost tend to remain fresh all the time you know your work is never done because we know security is a process it's never going to be a destination it's just a journey and i wanted the company name to kind of like symbolize that as well very cool so uh one of the things that's kind of interesting too that some of the listeners may not be aware of is that you started a hacker comic book <laughs> if you'd like to to share about that adventure yeah you know that that's a great question so i think once i exited you know pentester academy you know post acquisition i started thinking hey what are things i wanted to do for a long time and interestingly you know uh my kids are growing older and my son asked me one of the days when he googled my name he said dad are you a hacker and i was like yes and he was like oh does that mean you know you're breaking into people's computer and stealing money and <laughs> and i and i quickly figured you know what had happened is the mainstream narrative of hackers and hacking unfortunately has become very very negative and that's really where to an average joe when you kind of tell them hey you're a hacker you're a researcher the first response is very caustic very negative uh so i felt okay how do i go about doing something where i can kind of undo the damage which mainstream media has done around hackers hacking and what not and i felt you know for for the younger folks you know can i create a medium which they would love and of course even for folks you know who are older something they can go back and relate to so for a very long time i wanted to do something creative non technical and that's really where i said okay what about a hacker comic which is rooted in reality because you see so many movies like the matrix swordfish and what not where someone's just waving their hand or doing something crazy and hacks just happen in the background um <laughs> so so the whole vision was create a super realistic hacker comic where describe the hacking scenes the process of how that happens absolutely as it does in the real world and then you know across various issues so we put out issue 1 and now we are planning to put out a bunch of other issues as well pick up hackers from diverse backgrounds from different parts of the world uh you know different gender different race and and try to add that diversity angle to kind of what the community already is today so that was the vision and that's really where you know i released like hackers superheroes of the digital age uh issue 1 I printed out put it out at uh, Comic Con Singapore distributed at a couple of hacker conferences if things work out I'm actually planning to distribute it at Def Con this year you know if if we finally make it there and the idea is hopefully like every few months we can come up with an issue picking up a hacker from an absolute different part of the world solving world problems with real world hacking uh and I hope you know some people like it some get inspired but at the very least my son knows what real hacking is uh and that his dad is not a bad guy uh you know but but rather that's, who, someone takes pride yeah sorry go ahead yeah <laughs> yeah that that that's a that's a great mission and and what a good way to change the mindset is start with the young because you know some older people it's kind of hard to get through to but you know as they say kind of cliche children are our future but to let them know so they understand right. and kind of open their eyes to some of the possible career options they have and, and thinking of the the hacker thing that's pretty funny I was at this career fair for fifth graders this has been a few years ago it was before the pandemic and it was really funny when I was there because I was telling the kids at the career fair I was an ethical hacker <laughs> so one of these kids went over to the booth where the police were at and told the police that guy's a hacker <laughs> <laughs> the police walk over after that and you know ask you for your id or, or no <laughs> now they just kind of came over laughed about say yeah this kid told me you're a hacker so it's just kind of funny but i guess good for them that if they see something suspicious they report it but but correct. going back to that whole education thing correct it's it's rather unfortunate that you know something we we so love we so prize we so uh feel proud of you know as hackers as the hacker community uh unfortunately you know the mainstream media has completely changed that narrative but yeah i mean that's the mission uh you know and hopefully as i said you know a couple of readers i might be able to change their thinking about how hackers are and what they uh what they kind of like do and all of that some at a, also at a very small level what i wanted to do is 
there's a lot of misinformation about people uh, you know for people who want to get into cyber security and hacking and that's really where i'm hoping that you know rooting this in reality it could be an interesting read for them just to know how real hackers work yeah that's a great idea very very interesting to to be following those creative uh pursuits and passions because it's one of the things that some people they're not in the industry are getting started is cybersecurity, especially the hacking side, the security research side is a very creative area. You know, some people think more of the analytical, but there's a lot of creativity that goes into it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it is one of the most fascinating fields. And, and honestly, like right from the year 1998, 99, when I got my first computer and I got started, like even today, I'm still in love. Wake up in the morning. First thing I do is, you know, look at what's going on, what new attacks were discovered never gets old, never gets unexciting. Uh, and interestingly, you know, cybersecurity is also always a second order function. And, and what I mean by that is technologies will come and go, but when any new technology comes, there's going to be a security aspect to it. So in a way, the field is evergreen because till the time there is tech, there's going to be security. And hence there's going to be, you know, requirement for hackers, you know, pen testing, hacking, and, and all of this great stuff that we enjoy doing. Very good. So uh, we're getting down towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to share before we conclude? Uh, I think, uh, you know, overall, if, if you're interested in the hacker comic, you know, go to vrncomics.com, vrncomics.com, and, and you can download a free PDF of the first issue. And I guess, you know, with SquareX, if you're interested, we have opened up a wait list. It's a simple URL, sqrx.com. You can go join the wait list and, you know, we'll give you freemium access in the coming weeks and would love to, you know, get your feedback and make this product better with that. So that could be it. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Philip. Really appreciate you taking the time and it's so wonderful to be, you know, on your show. Well, thanks for, for being a guest. It was an honor to have you on my podcast. As I said before, I'm used to look watching YouTube or watching the videos and seeing you and it's really great to be interviewing you. So this is uh it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so much. And for everyone listening, we'll be sharing uh, links in the show notes to the comic, uh, to Square X, as well as social media for Vivek and, and Square X. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Philip Wiley show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.